Hello, welcome to this special farming themed edition of Talking Europe coming to you from Madeira. Now this place is known as the Pearl of the Atlantic, a volcanic archipelago that's an autonomous region of Portugal but physically closer to Africa. Today Madeira is probably best known for three things. One, its famous footballing son Cristiano Ronaldo. Two, the subtropical climes that keep this place warm all year round and that contributes to number three, the famous Madeira fortified wine. Well, in this programme, we don't have all that much time for soccer chat, but we will be taking you exploring this craggy island, a place where vines grow on almost sheer cliffs and locally grown bananas contribute to specialty Madeiran fish dishes. We'll also have reports for you from elsewhere around Europe, including finding out why French farm students are travelling to Estonia to learn Baltic know-how. And we'll be learning whether the EU's efforts at greening the continent have been bearing fruit. Let's go and explore. Well, we've climbed right up now. We're 400 metres above sea level here. And uh, you can see how the mountain has been tamed somewhat to allow vines to be grown here. Uh, we'll find out a little bit more about life on Madeira and farming here with Paola Jardim Duarte, who's president of the Madeiran Wine and Artisanal Products Institute. Hi, nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. First question to you, Paola. Before we even talk about this dramatic landscape, we are hundreds of kilometres from Lisbon and the rest of Portugal. How different is life here? <laughs> It's very different, especially as regards our climate and the type of soil that we have here, as well as the fact that it's so mountainous. Madeira is a volcanic region, and we only have 732 square kilometers of land. The climate is very diverse. We have several microclimates. In the south, we can grow tropical produce. Much further north in Madeira, we have seasonal crops. As for vines, they're everywhere across the entire island. Now, a lot of the farms here on Madeira, they're not even what we would traditionally think of as farms. They're actually quite small areas of land. How dependent are people here on European subsidies? The subsidies are extremely important for wine growing. The fact that we're on an island means our production costs for making wine, as well as regular farming, are extremely high. That's partly because we don't have factories here, so the whole production chain has to be imported. And all the equipment farmers need to grow their crops have to be imported, especially for the vines. All right, well, thanks so much for speaking to us, Paula Jardim Duarte. Thank you. <laughs> well, here we are then, coming right back down to sea level again. This is Fajan dos Padres. It's an organic farm which was actually originally set up by Jesuit priests back in the early days of Portugal's colonisation of Madeira. Now you can see all around me, these are actually banana trees. That's one of the major crops here in Madeira, as well as wine. And uh, they also grow here all sorts of things, avocados, mangoes, passion fruit, and it's a very natural place. There are loads of little lizards running around. We're here in the company of an MEP, uh, Claudia Montero de Aguiar. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Now Welcome you're... to Madeira. <laughs> Thank you. And you're with the Social Democratic Party, a centre-right party, which has actually been in charge of Madeira's autonomous government since it got autonomy, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. I think this place shows pretty well how difficult farming is on Madeira. Uh, this incredible landscape. There seem to be farms in all sorts of areas where the land appears cultivable. Um, but it seems pretty essential to Madeira as well, agriculture. Is it right? 10% of the population yes. works in farming. Yeah, it's true. We have three major um, uh, sectors, uh, a banana, uh, sugar and uh, the wine, but also horticultural uh, uh, products. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need uh, major supports because as you can see for the landscape, this is very difficult. 
Absolutely. Here at Fajon dos Padres, uh, there used to be a really horrible climb up a pass to get to the top. Uh, we have thankfully used the cable car to get here. Um, you talked about how important farming is in Madeira. I think I'm right in saying that 75% of the farms, they're so small that they generate less than €8,000 per year. Is this something that's sustainable looking to the future? Our role as uh, members of the parliament is to uh, make an alert to remember that outermost regions have an article uh, that uh, in the treaty that uh, defines us with some particularities. So we need to have in the legislation, in the programs that support the agriculture, we, we need to have derogations, special uh, help so that we can look to this sector for the future, more sustainable, because we, we want to bring uh, young people to the sector. 85% of our bananas are exported mm. and we need to import the material for helping the production. So the European funds are very crucial to development of, uh, of these regions like, like Madeira. Well, let's take a special focus uh, just for a moment. We'll watch a report together about an experience that's shared by farmers here in Madeira and all across the European Union applying for subsidies. Now, it can be a very complicated game sometimes, a lot of paperwork and red tape involved. There have been efforts to cut through that red tape. Our reporter, Luke Brown, has been to see if it's working. Ploughing up a temporary cover crop to meet Europe's greening requirements. This helps regenerate the land, but the EU also demands the field be left fallow for two months, meaning planting a cash crop like barley has to wait. For farmer Roman Cocrel, that makes no sense. We really have the impression that, not wanting to caricature them, but it's like it was decided in an office, without coming to the land to see what's needed. It prevents us from working. It means we have to use extra fuel. We have to spend money for the cover crop seeds. Romain is the fourth generation of farmer in his family on this land, Cultivating his 320 hectares is now much more than tractors and seeds. This is our daily life. We're always thinking about the administrative side. Even when we're sat on the tractor, that's what we think about. Romain gets up to 10% of his turnover from the EU's common agricultural policy, meaning it's primordial for the running of his farm. I feel a bit like a European civil servant. I have to be accountable to them because I receive the subsidies. I think we'd be much freer in the way we run our business if we didn't have all these administrative constraints because of the fact we receive subsidies that we need in order to ensure we earn enough. Romain is meeting with Gilles Lopin, a CAP advisor. They're checking his figures. There's very little physical paperwork. It's all done online. Finalement, tu avais pris des objectifs de rendement que tu avais fait varier suivant les parcelles Voilà. Là, j'ai sur sa marge un potentiel moindre, c'est du sable, je suis à 76 quintaux. He has to detail everything he does with every square meter of his land. Seeds, fertilizer, pesticide. These records are vital when it comes to CAP inspections, as breaking the rules means financial penalties. If we were to be inspected, like I was last year, when they looked at our nitrate usage, we could refer to all the information that we recorded in this type of software. There's no room for error. The farm receives 50,000 euros in subsidies each year. We're always a bit worried about ticking the wrong box or asking for the wrong subsidy. The financial impact is clear. If we get the declaration wrong, there's always an economic impact afterwards. It could be 2 or 3% of the overall subsidy, which could endanger the farm. Like many of France's 450,000 farmers, Romain knows that the CAP is a matter of survival. <laughs> the CAP isn't a bonus. It's vital for the system. If we didn't get the CAP, if there were a fair price that meant I could live comfortably, OK. Then I'd be fine without the European cash, even better. But that's not the case. France is Europe's biggest beneficiary of the CAP. Its farmers sharing almost 9 billion euros each year. With the future budget of the CAP facing reforms, though, and calls for further simplification, that may yet change.
<laughs> we're still at Fajang dos Padres, but we thought we'd come and show you a bit more of Madeira's beautiful coastline. Uh, we're still with Claudia Montero de Aguia. Uh, thanks for staying with us. Just a more general question about Madeira. Uh, along with Portugal, it's been a member of the European Union for a bit more than 30 years now. How much has life changed here? I think that a lot. As an example, now we can cross the island through the tunnels in in few minutes to come to the big cities. Also, uh, those investments brought development to the small economic uh, uh, cities that we have. We developed not only in, in infrastructures, but also education, questions of health. Uh, it's a huge impact on our day-by-day -day life, for sure. We're, of course, focusing on uh, farming mostly in this programme, but there is a lot of urban development happening in Madeira as well. Now, there are concerns about whether that urban development is contributing to floods, to landslides, especially uh, with climate change uh, impacting this island ever more. Uh, can this be remedied? Can that development perhaps be looked at again, slowed down? Well, the, the government, has, when, when again, once again, with the help of the European Union, has uh, several uh, lines, objectives, that goes aligned with the, the climate change, with uh, a more sustainable agriculture, a more sustainable tourism. And uh, for that, we need to preserve certain parts of the island. That's why we have uh, nature, natural reserves uh, where the construction is no... They, they don't allow the construction. So I think that this government thinks in the future. Because it is, of course, all well and good uh, investing in uh, nature reserves and the rural side of things. But is it perhaps a question of trying to look again and rebalance the picture of development? Of course, that development of the big cities is taking into account for the future generations. But we need also to create new jobs, so we need to balance. All right, well, Claudia Montero de Aguia, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, as we said, we are on an organic farm here and all across the continent, the EU has been trying to encourage more environmentally sensitive practices known as greening, partially through subsidies. It all sounds very nice, but has it been working? Luke Brown has been to find out. French farmers protesting in the autumn rain. They're angry at a growing phenomenon that's been dubbed agri-bashing, the general public blaming farmers for using too many chemical products. We are at the end of our tether. We're people who respect the environment with our farmers' common sense. We protect the environment. The protest is organised by France's biggest farmers' union, the FNSEA. They say French farming is one of the cleanest in Europe and that the public's concerns are unfair and unfounded. I'm all for us being whiter than white, but we also have to earn a living from our trade. A third of cereal farmers in the Paris region earn less than 350 euros a month. And that's not sustainable. The FNSEA is known for backing modern, high-yield farming. Cyril is the local president in Seine and Marne. But the methods cereal users are under pressure, with the government discussing the creation of non-pesticide treatment zones, or ZNTs, near residential areas. For people in Paris who want to impose non-treatment zones, well, they should come and see how it really is in the countryside. They would scare themselves a bit less. The FNSEA has launched a series of local good neighbour charters, restricting the use of pesticides here to the pre-dawn hours to limit its impact on residents. It's also a way to fight back against regulations being imposed by Paris or Brussels. We wanted these charters to avoid regulations that are so typically French. They're always imposing new constraints, which means we lose competitiveness. Because here in France, we always have to do more, more and more. Since 2013, the EU's greening priorities push farmers to use greener practices in return for their CAP payments. The impact of the greening measures has been limited, with individual states cherry-picking favourable criteria. The FNSEA says it wants a level playing field. Some other countries are a lot less demanding, and we end up being less competitive against this unfair competition. The CAP has to be universal. It shouldn't lead to imbalances between countries. We have more to lose by leaving too much margin for maneuver and sovereignty to different member states. On the other side of France, Antoine Baron is a different type of farmer, at a different scale, 
and who sees a different future for farming. Citizens no longer accept certain practices. The consumer's demands have evolved. It's irreversible. Antoine is a member of the Smallholders Confederation that campaigns for less intense farming practices. His small herd of organic dairy cows is allowed to pasture outside 10 months a year. It's a pragmatic choice that also has environmental advantages. We make savings because we work them less. We use less fuel, less seeds, and we can better sell our products. So the economic conclusion is very positive. There's no need to oppose ecology and economy. Each helps the other. The Smallholders Confederation is critical of the EU's common agricultural policy. They say it unfairly favours big landowners and that the environment still isn't taken seriously enough. They want uniform rules that reward more green farming practices. To maintain an agricultural policy, be it European or local, we need the way we work to be acceptable to citizens. So environmental progress is a condition for us to maintain the subsidies that we need. The environment is not a constraint, it's an opportunity. 30% of the CAP is set aside for green payments around 2.2 billion euros in France. While Brussels insists the environment will be at the heart of the CAP reforms, the exact outlines and their impact have yet to be decided. Well, do stay with us for part two of Talking Europe. We'll be heading into Madeira's capital, Funchal. There we're going to see how grapes grown on farms like this one get transformed into that famous fortified Madeira wine. We do hope to see you there.